All right, cool. So uh, I'll keep this short. Um, I'm Lucas. I'm a first year. Uh, I'm a music major. I'm here to introduce our next speaker. But first, I just want to uh, say a big thanks to all of our donors. We all benefit. Um, everyone benefits from your, don your donation. So thank you very much. And yeah, our next speaker is a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he is one of the world's most highly cited astrophysicists. He was voted best professor at UC Berkeley a record nine times, and in 2006, he was named... <laughs> in 2006, he was named the National Professor of the Year among doctoral institutions, he has produced five astronomy video courses, co-authored an award-winning uh, astronomy textbook, and appeared in more than 120 television documentaries. Please join me in welcoming the one and only Professor Alex Filipenko. Well, let's, make, let's make sure this is on again. Yeah, thank you, uh, Lucas, for that warm introduction. Wow, look at this crowd, I see. Lots of former students here, including Toby Lustig from fall of 87 or 88? Fall of 87? 87. Holy moly. All right, Toby. Anyone go in any further back than fall of 87? There might have been an 86er. That's when I started here. Actually, I was a postdoc here for two years from 84 to 86, and then somehow the senior faculty made this incredibly dumb move and hired me on their faculty uh, since 1986. So anyway, Toby, great to see you. We've been, we've been swapping comet photos. Ooh, I'd better start my timer. And uh, I know that Oski is doing some sort of an event at six. So at six or whenever you need to go ahead and make a graceful exit. Um, I was told we'd start at five, which was not realistic because there's a class here until five. So I, I prepared sort of 45 minutes worth of material, but that brings us up to um, six o'clock. So I hope you'll not uh, all leave at 10 minutes to six on Moss, but feel free to not stay for the Q&A session if you don't want to. So uh, anyway, Northern Lights and other beautiful atmospheric sites. Um, go Bears and beat North Carolina State tomorrow. Any from North Carolina here who are North Carolina State people? Well, it's, it's okay, we'll, we'll win, but, uh, but I, I, I extend my sympathy uh, to you because of, uh, not because we're gonna beat you, but because of uh, the hurricane, uh, Helene and stuff. So I hope you're okay. Anyway, uh, let's start with something that's not an atmospheric phenomenon, although it was thought by some to be an atmospheric phenomenon long ago, because it's been in the news a lot this uh, past week. Comets. Comets appear as diffuse, luminous patches, often with long tails. And in fact, uh, comet comes from the Greek for long-haired star, Aster Cometis. And here was a beautiful one in 1965. But these things were mysterious for a while in ancient cultures. And it's still the case in some places. These were bad omens, messengers of gods, harbingers of doom. Right, science teaches us that they aren't really harbingers of doom in most cases, unless they collide with Earth, which wouldn't be good. But anyway, here's from uh, Shakespeare in Julius Caesar. Cal Calphurnia tells Caesar, when beggars die, there are no comets seen. The heavens themselves blaze forth the death of princes, right? So anyway, we've come a long way since then and we know what they uh, look like and, and what they're physically caused by. Uh, bright ones are not all that common. Here was a good one in 1996, Yakutaki uh, McNaught in 2007, primarily in the Southern Hemisphere. In fact, I never got a chance to see this one, but it looks like it was a really quite nice one. And then in 2020, just a few years ago, Comet Neowise, which uh, generated a lot of excitement because we hadn't had a good Northern Hemisphere comet for a couple of decades. But now we've had this past week an even better one, and I'll show some pictures in a minute. But first, the physical explanation. These are basically dirty ice balls or icy dirt balls, depending on 
the relative amounts of ices and dust and gravel. And by ices, I mean water and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and ammonia and methane, anything that's frozen and forms an ice that can grab onto uh, little particles of dust, little pebbles, and, and hold them together. But as it approaches the sun, the ices sublimate. They go directly from a solid to a gas, sort of the equivalent of evaporation, which is technically from a liquid to a gas, but I won't knock any points off if you say evaporate on your homework assignment. And so uh, the gases then um, you know, aren't able to hold on to the little bits of material, so the dust goes flying out, and the sun's radiation pressure, the photons, the light, and the energetic particles that come from the sun push away on the dust and also on the gas, and then primarily the dust reflects sunlight, although there's also a gas tail as well that generates some light of its own. But uh, the tail points away from the sun because it's pushed by the sun's radiation pressure. So, you know, on its way in, the tail follows the head, and you might think that's because it's flowing through some wind with its hair flying back, but that's not what's happening. The radiation is pushing on it, and it's on, the, on its way out, the tail leads the head. And, you know, that's not the way hair behaves when you're in a convertible or something flying along the highway or something. So then lately, of course, there's been this one that uh, was discovered last year, but only recently was it really realized that it could become quite bright. And indeed, it became a naked eye comet, wonderfully visible through binoculars. So a friend of mine who lives in Portland took uh, this picture on Saturday night, last Saturday, and then on Sunday. Not many photos of it exist from Saturday because it set just shortly after sunset. And then I took this photo on Sunday night next to Brioni's Reservoir in Orinda, and then the next night from Grizzly Peak. And the photographer really should have told me to lift my arm a little bit. I'm pointing at some blank spot in the sky there, but you know, maybe there's a UFO there or something like that anyway. Um, but, uh, but it was pretty good on Monday and then Tuesday. Uh, there it is twice over the Brioni's Reservoir. Uh, there it is, and there it is again. And then, um, and then Wednesday night, Ooh, this is from the top of Campbell Hall here on campus. Now, we probably had a bit more, you know, light pollution from the city and all that, but still the, the nucleus, the head is, is fading. And um, it's getting kind of hard to see. And then I was at a, an event, a function last night where I wasn't really able to go outside. Uh, we'll take a look tonight what it looks like. But how many of you have seen it at least once this week and have been following it? Yeah, Zaki and Toby and, and others. Uh, it's fading, isn't it? Did you notice that it's fading? Yeah, Toby, you said from your place you, could, you couldn't see it naked eye yesterday. Yeah, you could see it. But it's amazing how well these, uh, these cameras with which you can make phone calls, it's amazing how well they do in taking pictures in just, you know, three minutes or something. So, um, you know... Here's a friend of mine who's doing, he's, he's on the faculty in Earth and Planetary Sciences, but he's doing a sabbatical in Ohio. And he said he went outside and he didn't see anything. But then he did the standard three second exposure with his smartphone and it was clearly visible. Yeah, that's because these things have much more sensitive detectors than your eyes are. And your eye brain combination refreshes 30 times per second. So every exposure is one thirtieth of a second long. That's why movies look reasonably continuous at 32 frames per second. You can't tell that they're discontinuous. But in a three second exposure, you're doing you know, 100 times more than a single exposure with your eye-brain combination. So they do pick up much more. So I'm hoping the thing will still remain visible because my students are doing a lab um, I hope it'll remain visible for a few more days with these uh, amazing cameras, uh, but no longer visible, at least not from a well-lit site with the naked eye. That's too bad. And here's its trajectory. Initially, it was easy to find to the right of Venus, but pretty low in the sky. Now it's in a darker sky, you know, getting up here quite a bit after sunset and after twilight ends. But the problem is it's, it's, it's going away from the sun, 
so it's fading and it's going away from it or from earth so it's fading so it's fading for for two reasons and, and that's too bad um it was a good comet but not a great comet hail bop was a great comet i mean i went and saw how many of you saw hail bop it was it was incredible right um you know so i'm still waiting for one of those it's been 27 years uh atlas um Su Chin Shan, opposite order, was a good comet, but not a great comet. And, and Comet West, which was the first really good one that I saw, um, Kahutek in 73 really wasn't very good at all. That, that was a great comet. And I saw it in the morning skies. I just went out one morning because I had heard about it, but there wasn't the internet. And I looked outside and there's this giant thing there and it just blew me away. So um, we'll see, we'll see. But when the media says comet of the century, that's almost certainly incorrect. But because by the year 2100, there will be, I would predict, another great comet better than this one. And then they say a once in a lifetime experience. I hate that phrase. In most cases, it's not a once in a lifetime experience. They say it because this particular comet will come back in 80,000 years. Okay, that's, that's true but there will be others and they look more or less similar. So it's misleading to say that you're only gonna see one comet in your life, but, but they are pretty rare. So next time you hear about one, go and, uh, go and see it. And I'm particularly proud of this photograph because Brioni's Reservoir was uh, quite flat. There was not much wind and I got the reflection there. Hey, that's pretty good, huh? So uh, anyway, okay, so much for the comet. By the way, you may hear news that there's another one that could become bright. It's called S1 Atlas. And how do I get rid of this thing? Maybe if I move it over here, there are fewer things at the bottom usually than, than the title at the top. This is a sun grazer. It passes or it passed. No, it will pass very, very, very close to the sun. So it'll probably not survive its passage around the sun. It's already showing some signs of disintegrating. Um, and if it survives, then on October 28th, it'll be very close to the sun just shortly before sunrise. And um, so it'll be much harder to see, but um, that's too bad. Okay, so that's, that's comets. Uh, how come, uh, let, let's get to, let's get to um, celestial phenomena and how am I doing on time here? Gotta stay, yeah, this is pretty good. Okay, let's get to, Atmospheric phenomena, which is what I promised to talk about. So auroras, the northern and southern lights. Here's a, a picture taken uh, by a member of a group with Cal Discoveries Travel. Those of you who are alumni already know maybe about Cal Discoveries Travel, right? You get these ads traveling around the world with various faculty members who will hopefully say something interesting and relevant. You know, if it's, I don't know, ancient Greece or something and talking about the pharaohs, then I can't say much, but if it's astronomy related or, you know, celestial phenomena or atmospheric phenomena, then, then I can say something interesting. So I was invited on this trip. So here we are on an ice field in Iceland. By the way, Iceland should be called Greenland and Greenland should be called Iceland because most of Iceland is actually quite green. It's warmed by the Gulf Stream. So there you can see the auroras and maybe you could turn down the lights in the very front here, but keep them on over most of the auditorium so that people don't fall asleep. Yeah, we should have had them there's a way of having these ones right there off. Ooh, that's worse. Uh, so um, turn off whatever you turned on just now. But um, yeah, do the opposite of what you did just now. A anyway, well, I don't wanna uh, waste time, but definitely auroras are something that are better in a darkened room. So um, here they are. You can find lots of photographs online. Uh, there's some more of them. Boy, this is really pathetic. Um, this is one of those things you really want a darkened room. And then, then you want to, how about you turn off all the lights for like five minutes and we're done when we're done with auroras. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That, that, that's, that's good there. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let me go back. Yeah. And then later on you can turn them on so people can see what I look like or something, but not, not that I care, but uh, anyway, plus I'm kind of lit up here. This might be better for the whole lecture since I'm showing lots of faint atmospheric phenomena. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. Okay, this is perfect actually, because there's one or two roads lit up. Okay, good. So there they are, they're very beautiful. And um, they have all these colors, usually green, but uh, sometimes red as well, and less often purple and, and white and yellow and, and things like that. Um, 
So here we are, you know, viewing them in 2015. This was actually a trip to go see a total solar eclipse that we watched from an airplane over the North Atlantic Ocean. But we got to see these beautiful auroras. But the primary purpose of this trip was for the solar eclipse. That one kind of looks like a butterfly. I mean, they're just so pretty. Look at them. Um, and uh, a friend of mine and I went up to Alaska and saw pretty pathetic ones. But zooming in on just one small part of the sky, we did see that aurora. Um, OK, and then more recently, there was a Cal Discoveries travel group uh, that went to Finland specifically to look for auroras. And, and we did see them on two nights. It was beautiful. And at uh, uh, you know one of those nights, we, we just got amazing amazing photos, uh, these by one of the members, Jerry Marriott. And we saw mostly brilliant greens, okay? And so in a gift shop, I saw this nifty t-shirt that has the, the brilliant greens, which are the color that you usually see. Um, I'll tell you why in a few minutes. So uh, auroras can sometimes be seen from airplanes. So if you're flying from you know LA or San Francisco to to Paris or London or something, or even from New York to Europe, you fly along a great circle, you know, modulo, whatever winds there are, and that takes you pretty far north. You fly over the southern part of Greenland, actually. So if you're on the left side of the plane, and, and by the way, it's usually a night flight, or there are some hours of darkness, if you think about how you're going. So look outside the left side of the plane, and um, you'll, you can often see auroras, all right? These were taken by one of the people on the Cal Discoveries Travel Finland trip on the way over. And here's a, a photo she got from one of the attendants on the flight. And the attendants are all, oh, yeah, we see these things all the time. It's no big deal. It almost becomes like blase, right? Like, oh, yeah, tell me, tell me when something new happens. So there are auras visible. So what, you know? But these were particularly good ones. Anyway, they can change quickly with time. This is a video that's sped up by about a factor of eight, I think. So they don't change quite that quickly. But some of them really do change in real time as you're looking at them, you know, uh, quite markedly, uh, much more quickly than I had anticipated, um, especially when David Cordfield told me that he sped these up by a factor of eight. Well, these were pretty slow changers. I've seen others that change physically much more quickly and maybe not quite that quickly, but uh, almost that quickly. So just beautiful. It's a magical experience. You know, you're just looking at these things and you wonder what the people thought when they didn't have a physical understanding of these things. So let's get to the physical understanding, right? To me, and I just told this to my students earlier this week, you know, if you have formulas and tables of numbers and equations and figures and all that, it can become boring. But really, if you, if you dig deep and you see that these tables and these figures and these equations and these numbers give you a physical understanding of what's going on, that to me and to most scientists increases our sense of awe and wonder about the phenomenon. It doesn't detract from it. So I did this in particular in the context of Walt Whitman's famous poem, When I Heard the Learned Astronomer, you know, and the person basically yawns and goes out and stares in silence at the dark night sky. And I understand what Whitman was saying, but my claim is that that could be a function of the lecture in any subject. It could be a boring lecture, but if it's made an interesting way and you show the physical relevance of the explanations, that to me doesn't detract from the beauty and awe and wonder, but adds to it. So what's going on with the auroras? So you've got the sun, don't look at it generally without a filter, but it's got this corona, which you can see during a total solar eclipse. And how many of you on April 8th went to the path of totality? Doesn't count if you saw only the partial eclipse. Okay, you have lived. The rest of you have not yet lived. I'm very sorry to tell you that. And the problem is that there isn't another one in the U.S. that's total until 2044. And that one intersects only North Dakota and Montana, little bits of those. You have to wait till 2045 before the path goes across the continental US. But there's one roughly every year and a half somewhere. There's one in 2026 in Spain and one in 2027 in Egypt and the Mediterranean and stuff. So it's a good chance to see the world if you go and 
see an eclipse as well in that part of the world, then it's the icing on the cake. But anyway, there's this low density hot gas that's streaming away from the sun and it forms what's called the solar wind. It's present all the time to varying degrees. I say varying degrees because here is SOHO, the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, blotting out the disk of the sun with an occulting disk. And you see that the corona sometimes erupts and sends lots and lots of charged particles uh, as part of these coronal mass ejections, they're called, and also solar flares. So um, they just go streaming out bundles of charged particles, uh, more than average per unit volume when you have these coronal mass ejections. And they go flying out, and some go flying toward Earth, and Earth has this amazing magnetic field which protects us from most of them reaching Earth. That's good because they cause mutations and most mutations are not very good for evolution. So what happens is that they get trapped in these magnetic fields and they, because charged particles have a hard time crossing magnetic field lines, but they go slowly along the field lines until they intersect Earth's atmosphere which is just a thin little skin, 100 kilometers thick around this big Earth, okay? And then they collide with atoms and molecules in the atmosphere and cause the electrons to jump to higher energy levels, absorbing the energy of motion of the particles. And then those excited electrons jump down to lower energy levels and emit light. And that's the aurora, the, the northern or southern light, okay? And it's just, you know, you have to remember that the atmosphere is just this thin little skin around Earth. And so the magnetic field lines intersect that thin skin at northern or far southern latitudes, but typically not right at the poles, okay? There's a, a region called the auroral oval, which is particularly good. So auroras tend to be active and bright after these coronal mass ejections and solar flares. So here's an expensive NASA animation showing what happens uh, when you have one of these coronal mass ejections, all right? You got the corona that's more or less there all the time, and then you have the big outbursts like that. And the bundle of particles travels typically between one to three days to reach Earth, and it gets deflected by Earth's magnetic field, but some particles get captured and especially those particles that get captured on the other side in what's called a magnetic recon reconnection event, they come down to where the dark side of Earth is, right? This side, you're not going to see auroras because it's lit up by the sun. But it's these ones that come in from the backside that um, create this auroral oval. And so you want to be on the night side of Earth. Okay, and then what about the colors? Well, the green is produced by neutral oxygen atoms emitting at a particular green wavelength, 557.7 nanometers, okay? I mean, a nanometer is a, a billionth of a meter. So these things are, are really small, but this is the wavelength to which our eyes are sensitive. And um, this happens uh, to the atmosphere up to about 150 mile height. So the atmosphere is very thin up there. By the way, you don't want clouds, which are low level things blocking your view. And then you can get red glow from um, lower density gas that's higher up, above 150 miles. And some of the red is produced by nitrogen atoms as well. And then you can get some blues from, from nitrogen molecules that are pretty low down, up to 80 miles or so. And you can get violets from nitrogen molecules above 80 miles. And it all depends on the density and stuff and which excitations are allowed and blah, blah, blah. And then you can get other colors from mixtures of these. And I haven't even given all of the elements and their transitions, but this gives you some idea of why there are colors, okay? Now the sun is active more or less on an 11 year cycle. You can look at the number of sunspots, which are dark spots in the sun as a function of time. And you can see this periodicity. And along with the number of sunspots, other signs of activity correlate, like prominences, little tongues of gas coming out from the so-called surface. It's not a surface. It's just the place where the sun becomes opaque. Flares and coronal mass ejections, they're all more numerous during peaks of solar activity. And the last such peak was around 2013 to 2014, 2013 or so. And, um, 
And so the next cycle, which happens to be number 25, that's completely coincidental from when astronomers started first counting these things, but it is doing better than predicted. Here was the prediction. Not sure what it was based on other than, you know, the weather tomorrow is likely to be similar to the weather today. So the prediction here looks very similar to the last cycle. I'm sure more goes into it than that, but I'm not a solar astronomer, so I don't know. But uh, it's doing better. Um, and we are reaching solar maximum. We don't know exactly when it'll be because the periodicity isn't exactly 11 years. But right around now to the beginning of 2025, something like that, we're going to be in solar maximum. And so there's going to be a lot of this activity, all right? And that means that when you have really energetic bundles of charged particles, some of them can make it through the outer magnetic field lines and even these middle magnetic field lines all the way down to inner magnetic field lines, right? Most of them got trapped out here or deflected. But those that are energetic can sometimes get, or if there's a particularly large number of particles, they can get to these lower magnetic field lines and you see that they intersect Earth's atmosphere at mid-northern and mid-southern latitudes including places like the Bay Area or even Arizona. Look at that. That's from some years ago. Now, that's a photograph. You wouldn't necessarily see that with your eye again. And I'll talk about this. Your phones or cameras are more sensitive. But uh, nevertheless, to even photograph auroral activity from Arizona is amazing. Here it is from Greece. All right. Quite amazing. And uh, here it is from Missouri. Yeah. All right. So on May 9th, there was what's called a G5 solar storm. That's, I'm not going to take so, uh, questions right now, Solace, but I will afterwards, okay? Solace was one of my most attentive students last year, and I appreciate that, but since there's an OSCE event and I've got a lot of material to get through, I'll do Q&A afterwards. So there was this giant solar storm. These are the biggest possible, the G5s. They're quite rare. The last one was in 2003, and they tend to come from the sunspot regions where there are strong tangled magnetic fields. So the storm erupted and one to three days later, the particles arrived and you can look online for predictions from um, NOAA, Aurora View Line, and red means good and green is pretty good. And you can see that the prediction was that May 10th or 11th, um, these things may, um, 12th, I guess, but this is the time in England, so it's still May 11th here. Um, you know, good, good chance of auroral activity. And then there's this thing called the KP index. You can look all these things up, and red and high numbers mean a lot of geomagnetic, you know, activity going on, um, whereas ones and twos are, are not so great, and they're greens. And so you can see, look at that, May 11th. Woo! Let's go look. All right, so Various friends of mine looked and people I don't even know sent me photographs and whatever, you know, I have hundreds of them. But this is from Landon Knoll, a friend of mine who lives in Washington. Look at that. Holy moly. Night of May 10th. That's, that's incredible. I mean, I, I have never seen such varied colors and stuff. And he claims he could see most of those colors even with, even with the naked eye because the, you know, the, the lights were so bright, they activated the cones, which are color sensitive in your eye. Uh, and, and here's a photo I haven't given a credit because I found it online, but there was no attribution. But I really like this one just because of the shape and stuff. Um, so pretty amazing. And I live in Arinda, and I could I went outside because students started you know emailing me, hey, we're seeing it, we're seeing it. I went outside and I could see the reddish glow by eye, and then the camera captured it even better, um, but nowhere near what it was in Washington or or Canada or. Scandinavia or whatever, right? And then, so then, you know, this semester I've been teaching my students about the sun and I told them on the 6th and 7th of October, you know, this, uh, the sun has been pretty active. Look at all these sunspots. Be on the lookout for auroras. This is on the 7th where I, I think, gave the lecture, okay? And so then some friends of mine who actually went with me to Finland happened to be in Alaska and um, they saw nice auroras. And then on... On October 9th, right? So just a, 10 days ago, nine days ago, there was a G4 storm, pretty darn good, right? Associated with this thing here, directed right at us. And so the forecast um, 
sorry, it got cut off a little bit here, was for our oils down to Washington, maybe Northern Oregon and stuff like that. And indeed, my friend Landon saw them near the horizon and then overhead and uh, incredible. And people started emailing me, here's from Maine. I was alerted that there was activity going on that evening, October 10th by Ginny Tao, who emailed me and said, hey, she's in Maine and she's seeing all these lights in the sky, you know? So, but I, I didn't see any from her into that night, too bad. But my friend Lauren Kinzel happened to be at Lake Tahoe and he saw them. So did any of you see either the May ones or the October ones? Let's do the May ones first. Yeah, a bunch of you saw some of the ones in May. Any, any of you see the October ones just a week or so ago? Wow, I wanna hear where from, but let's not do it now because uh, time is a ticking. It tends to do that, um, you know, sometimes. Most of the time, it tends to do that, huh? Okay, anyway, all right. So, um, so then my colleague, Burkhard Militzer, who's in Ohio, said, well, you know, he went out uh, a week ago, and he, he didn't see much by eye, but he saw a little bit, that reddish glow there, and then he took a three-second picture with his, uh, with his camera, and then he made a phone call. Uh -huh. I never tire of that joke because, right, they weren't meant to be that way, right? But anyway, so yeah, you, you see more with, uh, with, uh, with a camera and stuff. But um, you see more for the comet and the aurora. But unless you take a video, you don't see the changes in a single still picture. And for a solar eclipse, there's so much light that the, the photographs don't do justice. They, they give only a narrow range of um, good... Um, good exposure and stuff. You have to combine lots of different photographs. So, you know, watch, watch a solar eclipse with your eyes and with binoculars and stuff. Take a couple of photos, but the photos don't do a total solar eclipse justice. But for auroras and comets, yeah, the, the photos are better in a sense in that they show brighter stuff and, and more color, but they don't necessarily show you the, the, the motions and stuff. So what's happening now? So I downloaded the SOHO images from yesterday and today. And there's, there's quite a few sunspots visible. You can see the sun rotates. They're a little bit farther to the right than they were yesterday. That's how we first learned the rotation period of the sun. Um, so there could be new ones coming up in the next months. Um, the estimated KP index the past three days from October 16th to 19th has not been very high. One to three at best. And indeed, last night when I downloaded the map of our oral activity last night, it, it was really pretty pathetic, um, maybe way up in cold northern Canada. Uh, but here's the prediction for the next three days. And let's, let's call it five o'clock right now. That's midnight in what's called universal time, zero hours on the 19th of October. Oh, and they're claiming that the KP index will jump to four right about now. Now, it's not dark here yet, but it might be, well, it's getting dark on the East Coast and stuff, so maybe, maybe they'll see something, although maybe only in Maine or something. If you look at the prediction, and I, I downloaded this at noon today, um, and in Europe it was dark, and you can see that good fractions of Scandinavia are, are getting them, or at least forecast to get them, and... This is the Southern hemisphere here. But anyway, so there's a chance for tonight, but probably not from our latitudes. Sun's been reasonably quiet, but anytime in the next year, folks, stay tuned. And there are all kinds of phone apps that you can download. Most of them are free. They give you real-time alerts, Aurora alert, or my Aurora forecast, or solar alert, or space weather live. You know, there, there's a bunch of them. And so if you, have the, if you have the flexibility and there's this alert, there's a big G4, G5 storm, and you have the flexibility and the money and you, know, you have some time to fly to Fairbanks, Alaska or something like that and watch the auroras from there, or fly to Vancouver even. You know? So um, yeah, so, so keep an eye on them if, uh, if you wish. Okay, let's go to other uh, phenomena. Um, and in a normal year, I wouldn't spend so much time talking about auroras. It's because 2024, 2025 is um, sunspot and solar activity maximum that I think uh, 
this is a particularly germane subject. And plus, in May and October, people even, you know, pretty far south in the U.S. have seen auroras. So there's a good chance in the next year that you could see an aurora from wherever you live. All right. Let's go to phenomena that can be seen pretty much uh, all year round from, from anywhere. The solar halo and the lunar halo. So what's that? Well, it's this thing here, and don't go staring at the sun. But um, and, and in the talk where I don't talk about auroras, I talk in more in detail about how rainbows are formed. I won't do that here. But this is a, a halo around the sun um, where you used to have to block out the sun with some sort of an obstruction. But nowadays, cameras are good enough that you're not hurting them or anything if you overexpose the sun and it doesn't really mess up the image. So this was on a chairlift last ski season. I just, you know, I'm always looking around at the sky and I just took this from Heavenly or something. So anyway, it turns out these halos are the ice crystal equivalent of a rainbow. All right, so very broadly speaking, you've all seen rainbows and the sun's over, over there somewhere and you, you see the rainbow on the opposite side, not toward the sun. And if you imagine a line going from the sun through your head out to there, that's the anti-solar point. The rainbow forms a big, huge arc, 40 to 42 degrees in radius. Now, what do I mean by that? From the horizon to the zenith is 90 degrees. So a rainbow can cover half the sky from the horizon to the zenith. And it's caused by light going through liquid water droplets and um, it refracts, bends as a function of color. And there's more to it than that if you want to get into the weeds, but I don't want to do that right now. So rainbows opposite the sun. If you replace the water droplets with ice crystals, then the halo forms in a direction more or less toward the sun with about half the angular extent of a rainbow. So 22, 21, 22 degrees instead of about 42 degrees. And it's because a lot of the ice crystals form these long pencil-shaped things. They're all hexagonal. Water likes to do that for reasons having to do with the structure of the water molecule. But you get these pencil-shaped things, and if sunlight enters one face, it can be bent in such a way that it comes out two, one, two faces later at an angle of 22 degrees. So if you've got all these rays of sunlight coming in, and they're coming in parallel because the sun isn't that close to us, it's far, far away. And so given its great distance, by the time the rays reach us, they're going essentially parallel. So this is misleading here. They're coming in, and there's ice crystals all over the place in the atmosphere. And this can even happen on a hot day at sea level, because if you've flown in an airplane and been a nerd like I am and watched the temperature changing as a function of altitude, you know it's like negative 50 degrees Fahrenheit up there at typical altitudes. And so there are no water droplets. It's all ice crystals. The cirrus clouds are typically ice crystals, so they're all over the place. And they will then form this 22-degree halo. So that's kind of fun. And you can verify for yourself that the radius is about 22 degrees because largely independent of your height, if you stretch out your hand as far as you can and you spread out your fingers as much as you can, then from the tip of your thumb to the tip of your pinky is about 18 degrees, okay? You can do 18, 36, and you can, you can verify that by going from the horizon to the zenith. And here you can see I've blocked out the sun with my thumb in Hawaii, and this is 18 degrees plus a little bit more. So that's like 22 degrees, okay? And often people don't notice it around the sun because you don't want to be staring at the sun and you tend not to look in that direction. But often people look at the gibbous or the full moon and the moonlight, which is just reflected sunlight, will do this as well. And um, I thought I had another one of those. Huh, I thought I included it, but well, from the other night, but I guess I didn't. But anyway, how many of you have seen either the lunar or solar halo? Okay, well, yeah, many of you. So, you know, we've got nearly a full moon right now. There was a super moon. It's not all that super. They happen three or four times a year. How super can it be if it happens three or four times a year? And it's only 7% closer than average. So it only looks 7% bigger. And I joke with my students. It's like you order a 16-inch pizza and the delivery person delivers to you a 17-inch pizza. You'll be kind of pleased you got your money's worth, but 
it's hardly a newsworthy event, but anyway, the media makes a big deal out of the supermoon. And I know it's kind of romantic and all that, but anyway, we've got nearly a full moon right now. And so if we have some cirrus outside, go and take a look. Um, okay, here's another thing then, parhelia, sun dogs or mock suns. So they're sort of an extension of the solar halo, usually a little bit farther out in angular size or angular distance from the sun. Um, and, and they're at a constant altitude above the horizon. This is done with a wide angle lens, which sort of distorts things, but it shows the whole thing. Here's why they're called sun dogs. Uh -huh. I'm only kidding here, but anyway, you can see the mock suns, sun dogs, formerly parhelia. So what's happening here is you've got, once again, hexagonal ice crystals. That's how ice forms when it's not hassled. But these are short and flat. And they tend, they, they, they're all over the place with every orientation in the atmosphere, but they tend to orient themselves parallel to the ground because then they encounter the most air resistance. If they're this way, they tend to fall through the atmosphere. If they're this way, they're held up a little bit. So there's an accumulation of ones that are more or less horizontal and light enters one side and exits the other two sides later and forms these concentrations of light in the halo. And there's a chromatic effect, just like with the rainbow. In this case, uh, red is closer to the sun. So there's a, the Parhelion, and here's Mount St. Helens in um, Oregon, I guess it is, right? And you can tell the sun is not over here. The sun is off the screen over there because the red side is the sunward facing side. And here, coming back from skiing, uh, my wife and I noticed some contrails, and then, you know, she took the photo, um, but I noticed the thing, and I said, honey, take the photo. Anyway, so we have, we have equal credit, but had I not noticed it, she wouldn't have taken a photo, so I'm first. Sorry about that, Noel, if you're watching this lecture, but anyway, it was a joint thing, um, and um, that was kind of cool. We saw it in this contrail. And then there are lots of other parhelia. There, there's a like kind of like the secondary rainbow. There's one farther out like this, and there are all kinds of other weird things. And Pekka Parvianen, a retired mathematician in Finland, loves to take pictures of these things. So those are kind of cool. I mean, there's all kinds of phenomena, but they're rare, and um, understanding them would be a bit too much in the weeds. Then there's the sun pillar, which is sort of related to the uh, sun dogs because it's formed by the same flat plates, but in a different way. So here's the sun below the horizon, and yet you have this streak coming up. And there are some clouds up here. And if you look carefully, there are clouds there too. And so there are ice crystals. Here's a, a beautiful one where the sun is already below the horizon, but you can see this sun pillar. So what's happening here is that light from the sun is coming up, bouncing off the bottom, and then back down to us. And we, in projection then, see the light coming from up here in the sky, right? So those are, the sun's down here, the plates are here somewhere, the sunlight is coming up, bouncing to us, our eye-brain combination sees the angle at which the light entered our eye, and so that is this thing up here. And um, you can see these below the sun as well. So that's where you have sunlight coming down, and there's a plate of of this ice here, and then the light bounces up to us. And so we see the light coming from below the sun. And by the way, there's a sun dog. So that's kind of cool. And this is exactly like what's called the glitter path. When you look at the moon or the sun over a, a choppy surface of water, it, it, it gets you know reflected in every which way, usually missing your eye. But some of the waves have the right orientation relative to you that they shine the light into your eye. And this shimmers the glitter path because the waves keep on changing. I think everyone has seen this phenomenon. So this is the sun pillar is like the atmospheric glitter path. And then there's the sun rays or Buddha's rays or crepuscular rays having to do with twilight. I think everyone's seen those. They... Um, they occur when there are clouds, and the sunlight usually just lights up the atmosphere pretty much uniformly. But then there are clouds that block the sunlight, creating shadows. So they should be called sun shadow or cloud shadows, but they're called sun rays because what you notice is the bright parts, but if the cloud weren't there, the whole atmosphere would be bright. What's happening is there's a cloud there 
shading part of the atmosphere. All right. Anyway, so there they are, and they can come up as well. Why do they appear to diverge like this? By the way, here they are up and down. And, and this, I think, is the origin of the saying, every cloud has a silver lining, right? Because the cloud in its extremities here is thin enough for sunlight to shine through. I'm guessing that that's what the saying comes from. I don't know as a fact. Anyway, they appear to diverge because they're parallel. I said earlier that sunlight, by the time it reaches us, is parallel. But the railroad tracks are parallel too, yet they seem to diverge from a vanishing point. All architects know this, right? But you've all experienced it. You just generally probably don't even think about it because it's part of what you consider normal perspective. But I was at a conference in Austin part of last week, and there was this funky hotel that had all these weird things written on the carpet. You know, Austin says, Austin, keep Austin weird. And they spell it W-I-E-R-D. Look it up online. You can find Keep Austin Weird, kind of like Portland. But anyway, I, no one was around. It was late at night, and so I took a photo. And you know that the intersection of the ceiling and the wall, right, those are parallel. And the walls and the floor, those are parallel, but they appear to diverge like this. Okay. So then sometimes the sun is below the horizon, actually, even, but you see these clouds shadowing part of the atmosphere. All right. And this is a beautiful one. Uh, again, Pekka Parviena, and the sun's clearly below the horizon. There aren't any obvious clouds there, but there don't have to be clouds there. They just have to be beyond the horizon. And clearly there are clouds in the vicinity. And then this is uh, quite amazing, if uh, my thing will go forward. Um, Alex Schwartz, who used to run the um, Letters in Science discovery courses here, she was vacationing in Hawaii one day, and she had this pretty sunset. That was beautiful. But then she just looked the other direction for kicks, and, um, and she saw this. The best example I've ever seen of what are called anti-crepuscular rays. So these are ones that passed by her, and just as they appear to diverge from the sun, if you're looking toward the sun, they appear to converge on the other side. They're just usually too faint on the other side to be seen. But she had these amazing atmospheric conditions. So bravo, Alex, if you're in the um, audience here. Okay, how much time do I have? Not much. Green flash. All right. How many of you have seen the green flash? All right. Very good. How many of you think it's fake? It's not fake. Okay. So under very clear conditions where you have a true horizon, no mountains, no buildings, and very little particulate matter, okay, uh, the last little bit of the sun to set can be green, all right? And there's a lot of things that go into the physical explanation, including mirages and stuff. But the main part of the explanation is the following. First of all, it's not a flash, it's a glow. It's not like suddenly this big thing bursts into view. It's more like a green glow. So here's what's going on. First of all, Earth's atmosphere is not a vacuum, so it bends light a little bit, it refracts it. So when the sun is actually a little bit below the horizon, when the top part of it just set, it actually looks like it's still above the horizon. And that's because the light rays come in, they bend downward like this. Your brain doesn't know this, I'm telling you this. Your brain eye combination just sees the direction from which the light came. So that appears to be up there. So that lengthens both the day at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day by about two minutes, it turns out. Okay, so that's that. But it turns out that as with glass or water, the atmosphere de bends different colors, different wavelengths of light by different amounts, all right? It's got this chromatic effect. It's very slight, but it is there. So highly exaggerated here, but the blue rays get curved and bent more than the red rays. And so there's a blue sun above the green sun, which is above the red sun by tiny amounts. I, again, exaggerate it here. This is a process called dispersion. And usually molecules in our atmosphere or even the smallest amount of particulate matter will wipe out the violet colors and usually even the blues just a little bit of particulate matter will uh, wipe out the blues because the blues get scattered and absorbed, scattered by molecules and absorbed and scattered by particulate matter more than 
the redder colors and the violets just are lost. But if you've got a really, really clear view of the horizon, then a little bit of the blue, but the green for sure might be visible. I say for sure, this is still pretty rare. You need good conditions. But that then means that all these other parts will have set before this little green button at the very top, right? You've got this little tiny bit left over that isn't mixed with the other colors. So that's the last thing that sets. That's what you see. And then mirages, which I don't have time to go into, can lift it up and make the phenomenon last for a few seconds instead of just a tiny fraction of a second, which the geometrical effect alone would have given you. So that's the green flash. And um, you know, here is really an amazing photograph because it shows that there are various layers of differing density um, and temperature and you know, water continent stuff. And so that bends the rays by different amounts. And so sometimes the sun can even be split up into a bunch of setting suns. And the top one, is the video going? It's not going. Oh, that's bizarre. Well, it, the, at the last little part would have looked like this, but let's not worry about it. Last topic, Earth's shadow or, and the belt of Venus. So sometimes right after sunset or right before sunrise, after sunset, you look to the east. After Before sunrise, you look to the west. You'll see a dark region here, a pretty bright region there, and then a pinkish-orange thing there. This is the belt of Venus, the pinkish thing, and that's Earth's shadow. Earth is casting a shadow on the atmosphere, but it's not a completely dark shadow because these parts of the atmosphere still have reflected light. They still see the sun. The sun is not below their horizon, and that sunlight is being reflected down to here, and that then gets reflected to us, and so the shadow isn't completely dark. And then these parts up here see a barely set or setting sun, and so the sunlight has gone through a whole bunch of atmosphere. All the violets, blues, and greens have been scattered away. By the way, that's what makes a blue sky. Um, and if there's particulate matter, you know, even some of the yellows have been absorbed. But the oranges and the reds survive. Here's an Antarctica, shadow of the Earth and the belt of Venus. Here we are at, at Lick Observatory, Earth's shadow, belt of Venus. And here I am in a plane, and you can actually tell Earth is curved by looking at its shadow here. That's kind of interesting. It's actually kind of hard to tell that Earth is curved, which is why people, not, not surprisingly, thought it was flat for such a long time. Oh, I have one more topic. Solar and lunar corona and iridescence. I don't mean the corona, the physical corona of the sun. That's the corona. But there's also a thing called the corona, which you will see around the sun when it's cloudy. But be careful not to look at the sun. Block it with your fist or a tree or something. Look away. Um, there it is. There it is as well. Yeah, it's a beauty. That was on a bus ride in Iceland where we were going to some some you know, interesting place and just looking out the window. So what's going on? This is not refraction, it's not reflection. It's a, it's a process called diffraction. When, when light hits a, an opaque object, it gets blocked, but the light that goes around it behaves as though it's being emitted from these two points and all around the sphere. And so you get these waves coming out, which then constructively interfere and destructively interfere. So if you put a screen here, you'll get alternate bright green and dark regions, okay? And then if you have lots of colors, like white light, they diffract at slightly different angles. Um, zero for the what's called the zeroth order image. Um, but uh, as you get progressively further from here, then uh, you can see it. And you can see this with a CD or a DVD. I know that you can find these in museums now. They're only a little bit less in museums than vinyl records, you know, or record players or typewriters. But you can still find these things in museums. And if you, uh, if you kind of angle it around, you can see this effect because this is a grooved surface and it does the same sort of a thing. So here I'm on a hike in, in the Sierras and my kids got mad at me because they wanted to get back to the camp, you know, but I wanted to take photographs. And this is long ago when you couldn't just take photographs with the sun in the way. 
um, it would overexpose. And you can look quite far from the sun because um, sometimes this effect is seen in clouds quite a big distance away from the sun. So just on cloudy days, partly cloudy days, just, just look around. You know, don't look at the sun, block it out, but look around. And when there's a full moon or a nearly full moon, look around. There it is around the moon. It's much easier to see because people are more likely to look at the moon. This is during a partial eclipse. But then here is a photo. Uh, this is my, my wife's high school reunion. Just last weekend, I went outside because I didn't know any of the people, you know, and stuff. It's her high school reunion. So I felt like some, like, well, you know what I mean. I tried to be social and all that. But anyway, I noticed this. And so that was really, really cool. So I'll take some questions. But first, let me just say, you know, it is homecoming day. I know there are lots of alumni here. Uh, remember the, the great or perhaps not so great time you had at Cal, but if it was not so great, hopefully that was not mostly Cal's fault, you know, but uh, anyway, we appreciate you coming and visiting our campus and, and supporting us. Um, every little bit helps. And we of course know that there are many and many, many uh, worthy causes these days, uh, but I hope you'll think that Cal is a worthy cause. And in particular, I'm in the astronomy department, so if you go there and you put in the search box these things, uh, you'll find them. But also, I wanted to point out Lick Observatory, which is owned and operated by the University of California, where a lot of our students get their first real research experience. And these are all undergraduates and stuff, and um, they just get so turned on using the equipment and helping make discoveries. And most won't become professors of astrophysics. That's okay. You don't need many of us in the world at any given time but they become you know, people who are more useful to society, engineers, computer scientists, medical physicists, applied physicists, whatever. Uh, they're more likely to pursue, in the long run, STEM fields. And they learn programming and statistics and data analysis and logical reasoning and problem solving and all that as part of these research groups. So I'm particularly partial to, uh, to Lick Observatory as well as to my department as well. But, but um, just type lick in the search box and, uh, and you will find it. So thank you for joining us. Those who need to make a graceful exit, go ahead and I'll take questions.